Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Bill Pelham. I'm Jim Waxmoski. And we work together and we have complementary, complementary areas of expertise. Jim is a child psychiatrist, knows lots about medication, but he's a really good child psychiatrist in the sense he also knows a lot about psychosocial approaches to treatment, right? That's true. Now Somewhat. you can call me a good psychologist because I know something about medication, right? That's true too. Anyway. Um, so we're going to talk about multimodal treatments for ADHD. And, uh, and what that involves is talking about psychosocial approaches and pharmacological approaches. And then multimodal combining the two of those. It's a lot of stuff to cover in uh, a short workshop. So we're going to go through the psychosocial part of ADHD pretty quickly and the medication part. We're going to do both psychosocial and medication prior to the break. And then after the break, we'll talk about how you, uh, what the data has shown about how to combine pharmacological and psychosocial, which is, in, in fact, what most kids get in the real life, in the real world. So we'll talk about what the data shows about how you can combine things, and then talk about clinically how you can do it. So if you have a case, how could, how could you, as uh, actually, anybody in here an MD besides Jim? Are there any MDs in here? So everybody's a psychosocial person, you can actually help the person who's prescribing for the child you're working with by knowing some things that we'll talk about today about how you can measure, help measure medication effects and give feedback to the doctor. So our goal is to talk about psychosocial treatment, talk about medication, what we know about that uh, before the break, then switch to talking about combined multimodal interventions, including what the research shows, and then what you can do in a clinical case in a real world setting to implement combination treatment. And, and that involves uh, perhaps the most important question, sequencing treatment. If we have two things that work, you all know ADHD kids can be treated with medication or with psychosocial treatment. The big question is, which should you start with? Is there, is there data to show that one is better than the other? And if not, how do you decide for the child standing in front of you whether you should refer him to his pediatrician or to a psychiatrist to get meds, or you should try psychosocial treatment? So that's what we're going to try to cover. Okay, so in... Not so much in psychoso the psychosocial world, but in the medical world, you have to tell what your disclosures are, tell whether you have any conflict of interests. And this is just for me then. Jim has one that probably looks very similar to this. Um, and that is that uh, I've been involved in lots of roles with pharmaceutical companies to do many of the studies that we'll be talking about today and many of the studies that have been done with medications. I got involved in that many years ago because uh, we were doing studies of medication, very tightly controlled studies, and I was contacted by pharmaceutical companies who saw that we could measure things very well, and they were saying, well, can you help us measure the effects of our medication? So I got involved in doing a lot of work with pharmaceutical uh, companies, and Dr. Wexmonski has done the same, and these are some of the companies. The only one currently is uh, Novin Pharmaceuticals, which is based here in Miami, and we are both working on a... Uh, project now, and Dr. Wexmonski is the principal investigator looking at uh, a Novin product. So, so those are my disclosures. Okay, I'm going to go through the background stuff very quickly because we want to get over to, to treatment quickly. Prevalence of ADHD, 2 to 9 percent of the population. Why 2 to 9 percent? Because uh, there's no test for ADHD. There's no biological test one can give. So these are prevalence rates based on a variety of different ways of ascertaining whether or not a child has ADHD symptoms. The latest number is actually 9% from the CDC, and that's in the last, what, six months, Jim? That yeah, when you simply go and ask families if they have a child who's been diagnosed with ADHD, it's up to about 10% now. For boys, it's even a little bit higher, for girls being a little bit lower. And it's higher in some parts of the country and Rates Lower of medication very predominantly. If you're in North Carolina, you have a much higher rate of being medicated than if you're in Utah, or whatever that's worth. I don't know about Florida. I think we're somewhere in the middle. Okay, good. And ADHD is dealt with by all these professionals as one of the major problems for all of these professionals. Those of you who are psychosocial people may not realize that for, uh, health, for primary care health professionals, what is it, a third of all visits for primary care physicians are for emotional or behavioral problems? Correct. Something like that. At least in adults, if not in kids. And in kids, half of those are for ADHD. So for a pediatrician, 
about one out of every six visits in their office is working with a child who has ADHD. And then for mental health, for a child psychiatrist, it would account for a very high portion of referrals, right? It's probably over 50% of cases. And in mental health settings, probably over 50%. In regular education, in studies where people have looked at who, who has behavior problems in school, and then they've turned around and looked at what the children's diagnoses are, where they have mental health diagnoses, very high proportion of the behavior problems in regular education are accounted for or displayed by children with ADHD. And if you look at the surveys on the diagnostic rates of children in special ed, ADHD is the most common, even though just ADHD diagnosis did not necessarily get you into special ed. But if you start with who's in special ed, and then you look at diagnoses, ADHD is the most common diagnosis. So it's a common problem across all of these professionals. And it's a common, commonly known problem in society as a whole. How many people have read this book? Just raise your hand. Don't be embarrassed. <laughs> I know you didn't uh, walk by it in Barnes and & Noble and and then just get engrossed and sit and read the whole thing. Uh, this is a common children's book, a very popular series of children's books. And uh, in this book, the uh, fourth epic novel, the fourth Captain Underpants book, uh, heroes of which are these two little boys, George and Harold, are the, uh, all the books are about George and Harold. And George and Harold uh, go to elementary school. This is their principal. Notice he's wearing his underwear and has a red cape around his neck and uh, is flying off to fight uh, Professor Poopy Pants. And in that issue of the uh, epic series, we learned that George and Harold had ADD or ADHD, or as their principal, Mr. Krupp, thought, they had just BAD. So this is a kid's book, a children's book, not a book for adults, but it talks about ADHD. Actually, every book in the series talks about these kids as having a problem. Sometimes it's called ADHD, sometimes ADD, sometimes disruptive behavior problems, and sometimes it's just misbehavior in kids in school. And what they did is they, in the first book in the series, they uh, bought a magic ring on the internet that hypnotizes people, and they used it to hypnotize their principal and give him a post-hypnotic suggestion that every time um, they walked in, every time anyone snapped their fingers, he would go into a trance. And in his trance, he would take his clothes off, tie a red cape around his neck, jump out the window of his office, and go out and do superhero deeds. So what George and Harold did from now on is whenever their principal sent them to the office, they would walk in snapping their fingers, and Mr. Krupp would rip his clothes off and fly out the window, and they'd get off scot-free. I thought that was a very clever premise for uh, what an ADHD child might do they're smart and intelligent and are always getting sent to the principal's office. And that wasn't just me, that's what the author wrote. And the whole point of this is that this is what children read, this is what parents read. The previous slide was talking about professionals, but ADHD is something that everybody in society knows about. You can't go a week reading popular newspapers without reading about the ADHD. And ADHD has been around for a very long time. I've been in the field for a long time, and ADHD has been around for 20 years prior to when I started in the late 1970s. So we've talked about ADHD for years. We've always talked about these as the three core symptoms of ADHD. That, that hasn't changed in 50 years. The name of the disorder has changed. When I started work in the field, this was the official diagnosis, hyperkinetic reaction of childhood. Prior to that, people talked about minimal brain dysfunction, or they're still talking about this in the 70s. Minimal brain damage, brain damage, hyperkinetic impulse disorder. Since DSM-3 came out in 1980, the name has been attention deficit disorder. Attention deficit disorder with or without hyperactivity, inattentive type, and so forth. So the name has changed, but the core symptoms have always been the same. And the debate has been, how many of each of these do you have to have, and how do you best combine them to make a diagnosis, and there's lots of debate amongst professionals about that, but the name's always been the same. The kids all look the same. And this is the DSM definition, and I'm not going to go through this because I'm going to argue that, uh, that the most important thing in making a diagnosis for a child, especially for clinicians who work with the children, is not making a DSM diagnosis. 
How many of you now make a DSM diagnosis as a part of what you do with the children? How many people do that? Small number, that's it? In many mental health care settings, mental health settings, you're required to make a diagnosis. In order to, uh, to bill for the child's services in a school setting, you might have to make a diagnosis in order for a child to be placed. The most important thing uh, that one does, though, in initially evaluating a child is not making a diagnosis based on DSM symptoms, but finding out what the child's problems are in daily life functioning, or as the DSM calls it, impairment. You can't make a diagnosis in DSM without having impairment or problems in daily life functioning. So these are the symptoms of hyperactivity and inattention that a child shows, but these are the problems of impairment, the areas in which they're having difficulty in life functioning. Relationships with other people, including peers, teachers, parents, academic achievement, behavioral functioning in school, family functioning at home, even leisure activities. So Greg Fabiano, who spoke with you today, has done a lot of work looking at ADHD kids functioning in sports settings. And their problems are just as apparent in sports settings as they are in, um, in classroom settings. In fact, we did a study years ago, years ago, called the effects of methylphenidate on baseball playing behavior in ADHD children. Who's on first? Anybody ever read that study? It's the only study I've ever done in which we got a joke in the title of a major publication in a major journal. Who's on first? I only see a couple of nods out there. Anyway, um, and what that study did was looking at the functioning of ADHD kids in a baseball game. And we found that their attention problems are just as big in a baseball game as they are in a real classroom setting, and that medication was helpful for the children who had attention problems in that setting. So even in leisure activities, these kids have difficulties, which is why Dr. Fabiano is working with that, in that context with kids. And this is the most important thing to think about when you're doing your initial diagnosis and when you're deciding whether or not a child needs treatment. And the reason for that is the one, two, and three above. Problems in daily life functioning or impairment uh, is why children are referred for mental health services. In the Great Smoky Mountain study, Adrian Engold has been writing on for years, looked at why kids get into mental health clinics. And it's not because mothers lie in bed at night reading the DSM or reading magazines about the DSM or worrying about whether a child has a diagnosis. It's because of problems in daily life functioning. The child is getting into fights around the neighborhood with other kids. Nobody invites them over to go to birthday parties. Any longer, the teacher is calling on a regular basis to complain about problems at school. The parents are having difficulty with compliance getting along with brothers and sisters at home. That's why kids get referred for mental health services, not because they have a DSM diagnosis. In addition, we've known for 50 years that these three domains, peer relationships, parenting, and academic achievement, are the best predictors and drivers of long-term outcome for any child of any type. So if you want to know, you have a group of eight-year-old children, you want to know how they're going to turn out when they're 30. And you can measure anything you want to. The three things that will tell you more than anything else about how they're going to turn out is what the nature of their peer relationships are like, how they get along with other kids. In particular, how much they are rejected by other kids or have problems with other kids. Whether their parents use appropriate parenting strategies and are consistent in what they do. And what the children's achievement in school functioning is like. We know those three things, we can do a good job of predicting who's going to do well when they're 30 and who's going to have problems when they're 30. That being the case, since we know that ADHD kids have big problems in those three areas, relationships with peers, parenting issues, and academic functioning at school, we know that, and since we know that those mediate long-term outcome, that's what we should be focusing on in treatment. Not necessarily how many symptoms of ADHD, inattention, or impulsivity a child has, but what their problems in peer relationships, parenting issues, and uh, academic achievement are. So assessment of impairment in daily life functioning is the most important thing you do in an initial evaluation of a child with ADHD and in monitoring the child as you're doing treatment. You monitor these areas through treatment and you modify your treatment based on how the child responds in these important domains of functioning. And our goal of treatment 
is not to eliminate inattention or to eliminate impulsivity, but instead to normalize or minimize impairment. So if we can, to eliminate problems in peer relationships or to compensate for those by teaching really powerful adaptive peer skills so that a child can make friends, even if some kids don't like him, and have some kids that do, and to maximize adaptive skills. That's our goal. And it may very well be, I don't know how Jim, uh, I would imagine Jim might agree with this. I'd like to get his opinion. <clears throat> One reason to say you can't eliminate the symptoms is that everybody believes, most people believe that ADHD is a biologically based disorder, and you're born with it, and you're going to die with it. And we can't necessarily easily change the nature of the child's nervous system, which may be giving rise to the inattention and impulsivity symptoms, but we can change the problems of impairment. What would you say about that? I agree. In part, our treatments are palliative. There are no medication-based treatments that are going to correct the underlying deficits that we know exist in ADHD. And just like blood pressure, these are normative procedures. So. We've arbitrarily defined from what we can measure where too much inattention is problematic, partly based on what we can rate as impairment. So there, you, you, you can't eradicate the system because the system itself is necessary. In some settings, levels of um, uh, quick response and, and physical restlessness may offer some mild benefits. So they're not always impairing depending on the setting. And, and the goal is, is to promote function. And I think as prescribers, sometimes we lose track of that. Because if you look at every other rating scale ever measured, they're almost always symptom driven. And if you don't measure what the impact in, is in the real world settings, home, school, and friends, we can get caught up focusing on symptoms and push to doses that may have little additional benefit other than reducing checks on a rating scale. Actually, I would say that the, uh, I've done one really bad thing in my research career. And I don't mean a legal thing, but I mean one thing that had an unfortunate outcome. And that was Jim Swanson and I, 30, 33 years ago, developed a rating scale to measure ADHD symptoms because we were doing a study. And we're doing diagnosis by asking parents for information. And we're saying, geez, we're getting all these different rating scales. But none of these rating scales have exactly the symptoms that are in the new DSM-3. Maybe we should just take the symptoms in DSM-3 and put them in a rating scale format, and then we can give them to all the parents and teachers, and we have direct information about diagnosis. So we did that and called it the SNAP rating scale, Swanson, Nolan, and Pelham rating scale. That just took off and drove the whole field. So everybody started doing rating scales and structured interviews to look at symptoms at the time. And, uh, and we always knew the, the issue was problems in daily life functioning, but the symptom stuff just drove everything, and I would say still drives things mainly rating scales and structured interviews. So why is it important to treat ADHD in childhood? Not only because the kids are having difficulty now, but they have a pretty bad prognosis. So ADHD, kid, ADHD is not a benign diagnosis, not one in which kids uh, are going to overcome their ADHD or spontaneously remit from their ADHD. If you take the literature as a whole, and try to abstract from that. I think you can probably say that about a third of ADHD kids have a tolerable outcome. And uh, 15 years ago, this slide, which has been modified over the years, that slide, the first part of that slide said good outcome. But I, in 15 years since, I've realized that it's not a good outcome because there are very few ADHD kids who are doing as well as they could be doing if they didn't have ADHD. They're having a tolerable outcome. So they have a job, they get married, they have kids. They're not doing as well as they would have done had they overcome their problems with ADHD. So it's a tolerable outcome. And they have to constantly work at adapting to their problems. And then about a third of ADHD kids have a moderately poor outcome. And I think the best way to describe that is they have the same problems throughout the lifespan that they had when they were kids. So how many of you have coworkers at work who show the same kinds of problems in inattention, peer relations, impulsivity, and so forth in their 20s that you suspect they probably did show in their 8 to 10. I, I know people like that. You all do. So, and those create problems for those folks uh, as they go through life in the workplace, in social relationships, in the marriage, and so forth. So that's what I mean by moderately poor outcome. The problems they had in elementary school, they're now showing in their job performance. So in elementary school, they didn't get their work done. 
on their job performance. They don't get their work done. In elementary school, they had lots of absences, weren't really good at being responsible. The same thing is true in young adulthood and throughout adulthood. So a third have a, a moderately poor outcome. And then about a third of ADHD kids have a severe outcome when they move into adolescence and adulthood. Adolescence, what that looks like is early problems with substance use, uh, severe delinquency, which sets one on a path to problems in the criminal justice system, and so forth. So a third, a third, a third. And our goal as clinicians or as treatment providers for ADHD children is trying to move as many of these people as we can into that outcome category. So moving people from the bad outcome categories into the better outcome category. In addition, ADHD is a, a major public health problem. If you just look at how much it costs, how much does ADHD cost society, you can do a, a, a systematic cost of illness study. We did a review for that for the American Academy of Pediatrics in 2007. And, uh, and the way you do one of those studies is you find all the literature in which anybody's provided any information about problems that ADHD kids show, uh, whether, whether or not there is any cost information. So for example, if you know what percentage of ADHD children have committed a delinquent act and been convicted of it, then you can go to other databases that show what the cost of one delinquent act is in one child. And then you can take that information, put it together with what you know about ADHD, and, and come up with a cost for ADHD. If you know how many ADHD children have how many years of special ed over their career, you can go to a uh, Depart Department of ed, web ed website and find out what the cost of an average year of special ed in whatever state that ADHD child was, you come up with the cost of special education. So when you do that, you come up with estimates that are pretty high, and these are based on a 5% prevalence rate. When we did this, 5% was a conservative estimate. Now it's double that. So if you're going to say, well, is it really 10%, which the CDC says, then you can double these numbers in terms of the annual cost. Well, numbers like this are hard to know what they mean, so we put them in context by just showing you what the societal cost of other disorders are. So if you look at major depressive disorder in adults, the cost of that is about the same as ADHD, a little less than ADHD in children and adolescents. The cost of stroke in America is about the same as ADHD in children and adolescents. The cost of substance abuse is much larger, but ADHD kids are making a substantial contribution to this cost. So ADHD is a big public health problem, not just a small problem for families, a small problem for teachers. It's a major public health problem. So that's why we have to treat. We have to help the children and the families overcome their acute problems. We have to try to improve their long-term outcomes, and we have to think about uh, improving societal cost and the public health outcomes of society. So what treatments are effective? So first, these are the treatments that don't work for ADHD. I'll show you a slide next that shows, well, this slide shows what all reviews of evidence-based practices for ADHD conclude. All reviews conclude behavioral interventions, medication, and the combination of the two are effective treatments for ADHD. That's for almost every association that's ever reviewed it all of the major lists. So all of these interventions are not on the list of evidence-based practices because people have done studies that have failed to show that these work. Lots of ADHD kids get one-to-one -one therapy still, traditional therapy or play therapy or are put on diets or have biofeedback or neural therapy. Uh, chiropractors treat ADHD and claim to be able to cure kids with ADHD. All of these interventions are used in many places, every time I give a talk in uh, large audiences to big conferences in the community, somebody comes up and hands me their card and they do horse, ther horse therapy for ADHD kids, which means they believe that if you have an ADHD child, learn to ride a horse and take care of a horse, that would cure ADHD. It may not be, it's not bad to teach an ADHD child those skills. It might become an interesting hobby for them, but it's not going to cure ADHD. And just like diets, elimination diets, don't work. Supplementary diets don't work. Duct tape is there because of the case of the teacher in Missouri. You remember this three or four years ago where a teacher duct taped an ADHD child to his desk and duct taped his mouth closed? And then promptly when the child went home and told his parent that night what happened, the teacher was arrested and fired and convicted of uh, completely inappropriate behavior towards the child in the school setting. 
can I make one point? Yes. So if you go back to that slide, I mean, some of this, it, you know, it's not meant to be controversial, but the point is what's evidence-based, what's been shown to be efficacious in controlled trials. So there are lots of things out there that may have some efficacy that haven't been shown yet. It's, uh, for, and there are some things that, I'll, I don't know if disagree is the word, there is some emerging evidence for mild effects of elimination diets. The problem is we don't really know what preservatives uh, or artificial colorings are particularly problematic. Uh, they're mild effects compared to more traditional evidence-based treatments. Things that are becoming more popular like biofeedback and EEG, uh, there are especially in mental health where we have few, um, you can't run a blood test to diagnose most disorders of mental health despite what is said nowadays. It leads to a lot of treatments that get ahead of the literature uh, and biofeedback and EEG are two of them. For example, the most recent uh, EEG study uh, looked at when you actually give kids a true control in terms of these EEG waves um, and you use a real comparison treatment where the kids are doing the exact same thing but their capacity to control a video game uh, by controlling their brain waves, it really has no impact. So with all these treatments, you have to filter out the time and attention you're applying to the child. And some of these treatments are very intensive. For example, biofeedback and EEG. Two visits a week for 40 sessions. Anytime you have an adult spending a lot of time with a child, traditionally that's not a bad thing. Um, so, you know, it's important to recognize that some things that may be efficacious haven't been well studied, so they shouldn't be promoted before things that have been well studied. Uh, and some things that are widely used just haven't been studied at all, or unfortunately the studies on them aren't uh, readily available, and they can't outpace the popular press on them, particularly in mental health. That's a great point. In fact, I, would, I should say probably that there are some people now who would say that there is maybe enough information for neurotherapy or biofeedback to say that it's evidence-based. And, and one reason for that is that many people doing large reviews or meta-analyses, if you have a study where the uh, developer is looking at brain waves and they're looking at teacher ratings and apparent ratings as the outcome measures, if the intervention was one that was designed to change brain waves, then somebody who's putting this information into a meta-analysis or a review is forced to say, well, do I want to take all the outcomes or do I want to take the primary outcome? And in a case like that, if the intervention was changing brain waves, they might pick changing brain waves as the primary outcome and not attend to the fact that there was no improvement on teacher ratings or parent ratings or direct observations of behavior. So you can end up with odd findings like that. Uh, and so some, there are some people who would say, this works to change brain waves. The big question is, okay, does it change impairment in real life settings? So as a general rule, don't put too much faith in any one study, even the stuff that comes from our center. If you want to see it replicated, if you see it replicated across centers, you put the most faith in that. And I'll say elimination diets probably have one or two studies. Uh, other things like EEG and biofeedback don't have multiple sites that have been able to show that these things are effective more than a good control comparison that controls for how much time a professional is spending with the child. Never been involved in a duct tape study, so I can't comment on that. <laughs> Okay, so Jim said, you want a large number of studies. Here's the studies that have looked at behavioral intervention, the stimulant medication, and combined treatments. So these are lots of studies. So we know a lot about whether these things work for ADHD. That's why we're, that's why in, in this uh, workshop entitled Multimodal Strategies for ADHD, whatever the title is, we're talking about behavioral treatments and stimulants because those are the interventions for which there's a lot of solid evidence. And are you gonna talk about Stratera? So, I'll talk a little bit about non-stimulants. There, yeah. are, there are two approved medications that aren't stimulants for ADHD. And those would have 12 studies or what? The database studies. is smaller, but they, they've yeah. been replicated in multiple studies now. So if you look at stimulants, it's, it's way, probably way over than 300 now. The slide hasn't been changed in four or five years. Um, so lots of studies for CNS stimulants. When we say stimulant, we mean Stimulant. Um, no, no, the, the name brands. That's oh, Ritalin, Adderall, stuff like that. But real quick, since <clears throat> you mentioned it, stimulant is always paradoxical to parents who hear it. Why on earth would a stimulant make my kid calmer? Uh, stimulant really refers to the ability to stimulate um, neuronal activity, brain activity, and also to stimulate blood flow, which tends to be an, an, with, associated with enhanced uh, brain productivity. So stimulant has nothing to do with the actual capacity to stimulate motor activity. It has to do with central nervous act actions. And for years, people thought that that was proof that a child was ADHD. If you gave him a stimulant drug, uh, 
because if a stimulant drug, if a drug designed to stimulate people calmed the child down, that was proof that he had an underlying biological disorder. It probably was believed for a decade or more way back when. But now we know that what the drugs do, so we know that's not the case. Okay. So here are, uh, is an example of guidelines for treating ADHD. So I said before that uh, almost it, well, the previous slide says uh, evidence-based short-term treatments. I said this is what literature reviews show. This is also what most professional associations conclude. So here's the latest reviews or the latest statement from the American Academy of Pediatrics about how one should treat uh, children with ADHD, school-aged kids with ADHD. And this is different from the last one. They wrote this in 2001 and they revised it in 2011. So this says for elementary age children, the primary care physician should use an FDA-approved medication, and that was changed from stimulant medication in the earlier one to just say medication because there are a couple of non-stimulant drugs, or behavior therapy, preferably both, to improve target outcomes in children with ADHD. So the American Academy of Pediatrics says, preferably, you should be using both pharmacological and behavioral interventions with ADHD children if they're elementary aged. For children under six, the AAP says you should use behavior therapy first. That is, that is use parent training, use school-based interventions, use uh, social skills training, and so forth, before you do medication. You want to make a comment about that? That's coming from PATS? Is that where the recommendation is coming from? It's coming from several studies that recognize an increased side effect burden in younger kids uh, and an overall little bit less evidence, although the, the medications can be effective. Um, and actually, since we're on this, this is the one place where the Academy guidelines have recommended a specific medication class over another. Largely, most of the data is with methylphenidate-based products, or so Ritalin, Concerta, Metadate, Focal, and all that stuff. Uh, so they've actually come out and recommended that class because of a little bit better side effect profile potentially in young kids and because most of the evidence is there. In a weird, in a weird disconnect, if you actually look what is FDA approved, Back in the 50s, amphetamine or Adderall got approved for it being uh, down to age three for ADHD, even though there's very few studies of it. Because back then, you were allowed to get grandfathered in if you had approval at certain age ranges. So that's one indication where FDA approval probably doesn't mean a lot. There are a couple old antipsychotics that are approved down to age three that most of us would humanely never give to a toddler. Uh, so you have to pay attention to when something was approved. It's not always as straightforward as just looking for that FDA stamp of approval. And then the last um, recommendation, so this is young elementary age kids, young children, and adolescents. The recommendation I thought was a bizarre recommendation. The number of studies of ADHD adolescents, both for pharmacological treatment and for behavioral treatment, there are none for combined treatment, right, for adolescents? No, I don't yeah. think so. So there's very few studies in ADHD adolescents. In the whole field of mental health, there's many fewer studies in adolescents than there are on children. Same is true for ADHD. Um, so there are very few studies, and I, my read of most of those studies is that psychosocial treatments work pretty well, and there are fewer studies of medication in ADHD teenagers. And the biggest problem in ADHD teenagers is they won't take their medication. I mean, in a sense, it doesn't matter if it shows short-term efficacy. If you can't get a 15-year-old to swallow a pill because he refuses and the parent can't make him, then it's not a useful treatment. So I find this a bizarre recommendation. I think we have some slides in here where we talk about that. And, uh, and it's a, a perplexing situation. We actually have a grant, Dr. Weissmanski and I have a grant under review trying to see if we could work with families to figure out, and teens, to figure out how to get ADHD children who are refusing to take their medication to take it. Because if they did, then it might have a beneficial effect on their functioning in middle school and high school. But so far, nobody knows how to do that. And, uh, and I find this a strange recommendation, because behavior therapy that is working with the teens and the parents arguably has a stronger evidence base than medication. And, uh, and we did the first study of medication in ADHD teens in our lab 15 years ago and showed it has big, big effects. The problem is getting the teenagers to take it. So I would say, I think this is a good recommendation. Uh, this is a good recommendation. The question is, do you have to do both? 
and how do you decide whether you do both for a given child? And I find this an odd recommendation. But Dr. Waxmanski, what do well, you think? Yeah, I don't know how easy it is to get a teenager to come to counseling either. Uh, I guess that would be the counter argument. But I, I think the last the recommendation stems from the fact that the, um, what's known, what's, what's put out in the media, is that various medications continuing to get approved for adolescents and ADHD. And now almost every existing ADHD medicine has approval from ages 12 to 17 as well through elementary children. So my hunch is this is where it came from. Although, again, this gets a little bit confusing because when a medicine is approved for children, um, as long as you have a few teenagers in the studies, it can get approval for that age range. It doesn't mean it had to be shown to work in teenagers. If all the effect was in the younger kids and there were teenagers in the studies, the FDA grants you approval from six all the way up to the highest age you enrolled. So again, this is one of those areas where FDA approval gets a little confusing and may overvalue the effect of some of the treatments that have it. Okay, and then this is, this uh, <clears throat> raises a question that we'll talk about when we talk about multimodal and sequencing of treatments. We have two interventions that work. So we said we have a lot of evidence that behavior therapy works, a lot of evidence that medications work, but remember that, I, I don't know if you remember the title of that slide, it was short-term treatments for ADHD. Treatments for which short-term efficacy has been shown. Then one question is, if you have two, which one should you start with? Which one should be used first? So that's an issue that we're going to be talking about towards the end of the day. Which one should be used as a first-line treatment? Which one is used as a first-line treatment? Way more kids get medication than get psychosocial treatments right now for ADHD. Anything to say about that? No, that's true in terms of frequency. Okay, so what are components of effective comprehensive treatment for ADHD? Uh, these are my slides. I think Jim probably agrees with them, but I'll ask him. That's behavioral intervention that is parent training. And as you saw from Tom Deshaun's talk and Greg Gabriano's talk, parent training, evidence-based parent training is almost all behavioral or family behavioral in nature. And there are a lot of different programs, and I'll put a slide up showing that later. There are a variety of school interventions that can be done, all classroom management-based interventions primarily behavioral or cognitive behavioral. And then child interventions, behavioral or cognitive behavioral, focused on teaching the child social, uh, teaching the child how to better get along with other children, focused on peer relationships. So these are the big three parts of behavioral intervention that most ADHD children need. This is the hardest thing to change. So peer relationships are the hardest things to deal with and the most expensive because they can't, you can't do it in an office setting. So the reason I say not automatic is there are some ADHD children who have good peer relationships. If they have good peer relationships, then you don't be, need to be doing a peer-focused intervention. It costs a lot of money. You just don't need to be doing it. And then I think, I think we agree that medication should be an adjunct treat, adjunctive treatment if you're doing these, depending on a variety of circumstances that we'll talk about later. You want to say anything about that? Yeah. I mean, I think the common counter argument to that comes out of practicality. One, are these services available to children in a variety of settings? Two, will parents access them? Where it's uh, the way the American health insurance system is set up, it's not hard to access medication because most pediatricians will prescribe it. Most children have a pediatrician or at least a primary care provider. Whereas most of these behavioral interventions are not being applied in primary care offices. Uh, so I think that becomes the argument, but it isn't one out of efficacy. It's one out of practicality and feasibility. Yes, I would agree with that. Uh, and also, I, uh, I've heard Dr. Fabiano talk before, so I knew everything he was going to say. The one uh, point he made at the very end of his talk that captured my attention was his comment about how many children in America are involved in youth sports activities. Anybody catch that number? 35 million kids go to youth soccer, youth baseball, youth hockey, youth football. That's a very, from a public health perspective, made me think, well, geez, we really are in the wrong place in terms of trying to get fathers taught how to work better with their children. Maybe we should be enrolling all the fathers of those 35 million children in a program teaching them how to be coaches. Don't even tell them it's about parent training. Tell them it's about teaching them to be a coach. And they learn the same things. So, and that's because Jim is right, there's much less access for the psychosocial treatments that we do in mental health field than there is for medication. Okay, we talked about the three components, parent training, uh, 
school intervention or child intervention quickly. Why is it important to include parent training and treatment? As Mark Atkins said yesterday in his talk, nobody teaches anybody how to be a parent. How many people in here are parents? Raise your hand. Leave your hands high up, okay? And then put your hand down if you were taught how to be a parent before you had a child. Okay, notice almost no one's hands went down. So nobody gets taught how to be a parent before you have a child. You might be given, I mean, at it best. Help me. What? It didn't help me. <laughs> Did you go to parent training before? Well, they teach us how to do it as child psychiatry residents. Oh, which is oh a very I see. Okay, okay. Practice of telling people with kids how to parent their kids when you don't have kids. It's, uh, it, it would be You're right. I should have not raised my hand because I learned all the same in my training. But, uh, but it is very different when you try to apply it to your own child. So nobody teaches people how to be parents. And arguably, that's the single most important thing we do as, peop as a race, as people, as a species, is we raise young. And we don't teach each other how to do it. Uh, what, did, what was the example he used? We spend more time teaching people how to drive. Yeah, you also, in most states, have to have a license to fish. But you don't have to have a license at all to be a parent. You can just have the right biological equipment and meet somebody else with the right biological equipment, and you can produce a child with no training, no license, no nothing. So we really need to work on how to, how to figure out some way to get parents Learning how to be better parents, that's going to result in improvement of ADHD kids' lives, all other kids' lives with mental health problems. Uh, parents of ADHD kids have a lot of stress. Look at this next slide. Those of you who said you're parents, put your hand up. Put your hand up if your children have never caused you any stress. <laughs> now notice nobody's hands go up, right? Everybody who has kids know that kids are stressful. How many people in the room don't have kids? Okay, so you guys look at what the fact that nobody put their hands up when they said that their kids never caused them any stress. It's very stressful to have kids, and I presume most of you don't have ADHD kids or another child with a handicapping condition of any type. It's very stressful for regular parents. It's really stressful if you happen to have a child who has ADHD. Here's a mother who had five ADHD children. <laughs> Lest you think that we're politically incorrect, here, this is not a rifle, it's a, it's a broom with a fork tied on the end of it that she's using to stick up the pharmacist to get some meds for herself to deal with her ADC children. There are actually studies showing that uh, you can manipulate this in laboratory settings and show that children with behavior problems cause parents, cause stress in parents, and parents, some parents cope with that stress by drinking. Some parents have negative affect, either anger or depression as a result, and drinking and negative affect feed back into maladaptive parenting, which makes the child behavior problems worse. So you have a vicious cycle there, and this more than anything else tells us why we need to do uh, an emphasis on parenting, right? Because the children cause these problems in their parents, and then their parents' bad parenting exacerbates the problems in the children. So what does parent training involve? How many people already know this? How many people know what behavioral parent training is? Only a small number? How many, of you, how many people do behavioral parent training with, in a clinical setting or with the people that you work with? Raise your hand high so I can see. Most of you don't. Um, do you guys work in schools? Are you, are you Miami-Dade people? Miami-Dade Miami people. How many other Miami-Dade people are there in here? OK. The people who didn't raise their hands, in what settings are you working? School? Yes, yes, it is. School settings, any other settings in which you're working other than schools where you're not doing parent training? There's got to be because only, only a few people raise their hands. Are you, some of you working in after school settings? Hmm? You have an office where you do the parenting? Okay, so behavioral parent training. Is, uh, involves teaching the parents parenting skills, focusing on teaching them how to ha manage the child's behavior, and then working on the family relationships, the parent-child relationship. And it's done by teaching the parents parenting skills. So as Dr. Fabiano pointed out, he believes that uh, that's a problem for fathers. That if you tell fathers you're gonna teach them better parenting skills, that you're not gonna meet with a lot of success from fathers. Like the one father who told him, 
to do you know what when he told the father to tell his child to get off the, the uh, back of the goalpost. But you're focusing on teaching parent skills. Is that you? That was me. I don't have a clip. Um, so teach parents parenting skills, and you're teaching parents then how to work with their children. So the treatment for uh, ADHD kids is actually teaching skills to the parents. The parents then have to go home and implement the skills that you taught them. And it's their implementation of those skills with their child, the changes in the way they parent, that are going to have the, the to result in the child's changing their behavior. So Dr. Fabiano showed a couple of slides showing that if you had parents go to, I think it was a PCIT or Triple P parenting program, that you got the parents to praise kids more and to issue fewer negative verbalizations or negative comments to the kids. And that resulted in the children's behavior improving. So what we're teaching parents is how to be better parents. And it's their implementing that that changes the child. If we had parents come to parent training, they learned everything we were teaching them, but they never went home and did anything with it, then it would have absolutely no impact on their child. Their child would be exactly the same as beforehand. So it's teaching skills to parents. So, it's, uh, so that's an important point to keep in mind. Hmm. Uh, I want to mention just a couple of points here. Look at this one right here. Don't expect instant changes. Again, remember that we're teaching the parent a skill, and they're starting to do it at home. It's going to take some time for that child to change, because the child has to learn that the parent's now different, and the parent has different expectations. It's going to be more systematic, uh, praise more, be less negative, stick to what they're uh, they're asking the child to do and so forth. And it takes a while for the child to learn that. So unlike medication that does produce instant changes, what, 30 minutes, 45 minutes for methylphenidate? This is a longer process. And you have to tell parents that. Tell parents that they have to try this and then they have to stick with it. And the stick with it part is really important. How many people here used uh, time out with their kids? as a consequence of some type. OK, put your hands down. Thank you. How many people uh, used time out, discovered that it worked well, and used it only once, and then decided never to use it again? Because they thought that if they did it once, that would teach the child everything he needed to know for the next 10 years. Well, that's an absurd example. Nobody does that. But we need to think in those terms. I'm not, we're not talking about doing something once. If you discover something that works with your child, then you need to be doing it for a long time. That's what we're teaching parents. They have to change their behaviors and have them become second nature in parenting. And then they have to just keep doing that for a long time, not for a short time. And these other points I'll get to in just a second. This is one important one to keep in mind. And that's just that the nature of parenting changes as you move through different ages. I think Dr. Deshaun is the one that said, we all have great relationships with our kids until they're interfered with by something called adolescence. So when a child becomes an adolescent, the nature of parenting may need to change. So if you're working with a, a child, or you're working with a case or a patient or in a school setting, and the child's doing fine for elementary school, you need to be thinking, OK, he's going to transition to middle school next year. He's going to be 12 or 13. Do I need to be telling the parents something that's going to be different in the future and then setting them up to be prepared to come back and learn some additional skills? So you have to plan on major developmental transitions. The other point to make is that parent training can be offered in any setting. Mental health settings, primary care settings, churches, youth sports leagues, all sorts of settings. You don't have to do it in a mental health setting. And there are many studies documenting the effects of it. So Here's are some of the evidence-based parenting programs. And this is a short list. There are probably uh, 30 evidence-based parenting programs. These are the ones that are commercially available. Triple P, Parent Management Training, Incredible Years, Helping the Non-Compliant Child, PCIT, Parent Management Training, COPE, Chuck Cunningham's program. All of these are commercially available. What's the difference in them? Not a lot, because they all include these common elements. 
So this, this would be, say, a 10-session parenting program. Session one, you teach parents how to set up home rules. Session two, you teach them about ignoring inappropriate behavior, praising more, and so forth. All of these components are things that all of those parent training programs I just said, I just uh, had up there, do. Okay, so you have 30 different ones, all have a common set of components. What that means is you don't have to buy Triple P, which is very expensive. Is anybody here doing Triple P in your agency? You guys are? So what do you have to pay? It was $25,000 for the initial training. Yeah so, yeah, so triple P's, it's very good stuff, but what you're paying for is uh, slick materials and, uh, and the fact that they have a very large operation now. But it's very good. As Greg said, uh, it's embarrassing to all the rest of us in the field to have triple P existing because their stuff is so good. They've done all the studies that they need to do. But you don't have to pay for that because, uh, because the same elements uh, are in the workshop that Jessica Robb did yesterday and she can teach you how to do exactly the same thing. It's on our website, that Evans Based Practice website. It's exactly the same thing. It just doesn't have all the bells and whistles. Chuck Cunningham's COPE program, I think he might charge $100 for a manual or maybe $150 for a manual, and you can Xerox it as many times as you want. You can do anything you want to with it. So instead of $25,000, it would be $150, plus watching a video on the web that's free. So keep that in mind, that there are lots of different versions of these as long as they have the core key ingredients. Do you remember in my talk yesterday I showed you Bruce Chorpita's list of what the common elements are in behavioral interventions? If you have those common elements, you have these kinds of things in there, then whatever you do, if you do it with good clinical judgment, good clinical practice, is going to be as good as any of these evidence-based approaches. And there are many different formats for this. Some of these are based on uh, working with individual parents. Others are based on working with parents in groups. Uh, some of them are uh, web or phone-based interventions. Some of them are self-directed. As Dr. Fabiano said, fathers don't seem to, be do, to do very well with self-directed parent training. Mothers do do well with that. So there are lots of different ways of doing these. As long as you have the core interventions, they all work. The core components, they all work. So why is it also important to use ADHD, I mean to use interventions for ADHD kids in school settings? That's all I'm gonna say about parent training now, but I will encourage you, if you wanna know more, uh, go to our website and, and sign up for uh, the, the workshop that Jess Robb does, which is a generic parent training version of uh, all of those evidence-based programs, and you'll get for a very small amount of money a really good parent training program. Or you can wait till the next Children's Trust RFP and, until the trust has another 25,000 bucks and then we can get Triple P back, which is a very good program, and, uh, and do more training with that. So why do we do ADHD in school settings? Well, most ADHD kids get referred for treatment by the teacher. So the teacher goes to the parent to complain about the problems at school, and the parent says, well, what should I do? And the teacher says, well, why don't you take your child to your pediatrician and see if they have ADHD, and that's the first referral for most ADHD kids. It comes from the school, from the teacher's initiative. And then why do teachers do that? ADHD kids have terrible problems in school settings. The research literature shows all of these things. A third of ADHD kids have academic, academic problems every year in school for their entire school career. So it just means you count Count these up for a big sample of ADHD kids. You'll find a third of them have one of these problems every single year for their entire school career. That's 16 times higher than the rate of non-ADHD kids in school settings. 29% uh, have a school discipline problem every month. 30 times higher rate than the rest of the population. So they have terrible problems in school settings, including being held back, being in special ed, dropping out of school, having lower grades, absentee rates, and so forth. So serious problems in school settings, which means we need to be intervening in school settings. The evidence-based interventions for ADHD in school settings are behavioral interventions, which are usually classroom management-based interventions or 
uh, who was talking about, po oh, Mark, Di X, Mark Atkins, talking about positive behavioral support, PBS. So PBS is one of the most evidence-based interventions for doing classroom-based, school-wide or individual classroom-based interventions for kids with problems. Uh, Dr. Atkins also showed a slide for the Good Behavior Game, which is a simple school-wide classroom-based program that shows big effects in school settings. They're all behavioral programs designed to be implemented by classroom teachers with training and guidance from school support staff or outside consultants. And it's way more than hundreds of studies. It's probably thousands of studies show that these are effective ways of, uh, of dealing with ADHD kids in school settings. And I'm going to skip all the more intensive ones. The typical way you work with a child in a school setting is to try simple interventions first and then move to more complex ones. But I just want to show one thing, and that is a daily report card. How many of you, how many people here have worked with an ADHD child in a clinical setting or a school setting? Just raise your hand. All right? So how many of you used a daily report card or taught, oh, that is great. Holy smokes. That's the highest percentage of people who raise their hand when I ask that question I've ever seen. That's really good because every ADHD kid in the country should have one of these. It's the easiest thing to do, costs virtually no money at all. It gets the teacher, it gets the parent on the same page as the teacher and the school, and it changes kids' behavior. All it is is having the teacher say, okay, here's what this child's problems are. Here's some goals we're going to set up. I'm going to evaluate those every day in some simple way and then send a little report home to the parent. And the parent then provides some positive consequence at home for a child having had a good day. That's all it is. You can download a 14-page packet from our website at FIU called How to Do a Homeschool Daily Report Card. And then you give it to a parent. Parent can take it to the teacher. Parent and teacher together can set one up. And it, it costs nothing, and it's very effective. What does a daily report card look like? For a typical child, it might look something like this. So the teacher, the teacher picks rule, pick, picks, picks problem areas, and then the teacher picks a goal. So for this particular child, completing assignments within a designated time at 80% accuracy was what the teacher selected as what she thought was an achievable goal for that child that would result in improvement. So that's what she defined. She evaluates that in this case in the different <coughs> Subject areas throughout the day, a couple of rules for recess and lunch also, and she just checks it off as the day goes on and then sends it home with the parent. A simple intervention, cost only what it costs to Xerox the piece of paper, and many studies have shown that it works. Here's a bad example of one, though. Okay, I say bad example because there are three rules, I mean three goals, Gets along with other kids. Now, how many seven-year-old kids would know what that meant? You have, to have a you have to have a long list. You have to say, well, it means none of this, none of this, none of this, none of this, and so forth. It's much better to tell a child exactly what you're talking about and exactly how many times he can do it. This wouldn't work at all for a child with ADHD. So you have to be explicit. And then these are more complex interventions we'll skip. So we talked about parent training, we talked about school interventions. Peer-based interventions are far more complicated. And the reason you do them is because I already showed you that they have bad peer problems, problems with other children. And problems with other children is one of the biggest drivers of bad long-term outcomes. What are the problems they show? This is from an old study where we asked all the children in classrooms to tell us about all the other kids in classrooms. Then we went back later and found out who had ADHD and who didn't have ADHD. And you find that if you ask all uh, children in an elementary age classroom to nominate who tries to get other people into trouble, that nomination is given for half the ADHD boys and only a third of all the rest of the boys in the class. Play the clown and get others to laugh, twice as likely for an ADHD child, almost three times more likely to be bossy, tell other kids what to do. This is sad. Twice as likely to be the last person chosen to be in group activities, like at recess, for example, and three times more likely to start a fight over nothing. So this is peers' reports about other children. The peers didn't know that they had ADHD. They just knew what they were like in their class. So this is prototypic problems that ADHD children show. 
and we need to figure out how to teach them to be better with other children. If we can't do that, then they're going to have a, a, a bad trajectory in the long run. We need to teach them how to get along better with other children and make sure they do it. It's hard to do that. Most interventions that do this focus on teaching social skills and teaching it in context in which children are engaged in activities with other children. Like Dr. Fabiano talked about soccer games. You want to have a soccer context or some other context where kids are doing things together and you can see what their problems are and give them feedback and provide consequences in a real life setting, which means it's very hard to do anything in an office. The place that these interventions are done are in school settings. Did, uh, any, was anybody here last year at this conference or two years ago who went to Dr. Did you go to Dr. Lachman's workshop on coping power, for example? So that's teaching a school-based intervention that can be used to uh, teach disruptive, problematic kids how to get along better with other kids. But it's done in school settings. It could also be done in after-school settings. You can also do this in uh, summer program settings, after school settings, any setting which you can have kids in kid-like activities doing things. You could even set it up in a clinic if you had to, but you can't do it one-on-one -on -one in an office. It won't work at all. There's nothing you can do in that context. All of these other points are the same as in the other slides that I showed you. Don't expect instant changes because the child has to learn some skills and then practice implementing those with other children, and over time he's going to get better he or she is going to get better. Okay, we've been doing this for a long time in a summer program setting. Dr. Fabiano mentioned that. Why do we work in a summer setting? Because that's when kids are interacting with other kids. We work on teaching sports skills and knowledge and cooperation, building friendships with other kids. Uh, we also minimize summer learning loss when we do that. We teach the child how to be compliant with his counselors and we teach parents how to do a daily report card. So it teaches lots of different things. And it's gotten lots of awards and it's done in lots of places around the country. How many of you have ever uh, referred a child to one of our summer programs? So I can see a small number. You should. They're, these are really good programs and they're run every summer. And the trust, the Children's Trust funds, I don't know, maybe 75 to 100 slots for kids, so it doesn't cost for about 100 kids, it doesn't cost anything, and we usually have a study going on that's also free, so there are 150 or so children who could get these intensive summer programs at no cost. So you should look on our website and refer kids to it. And what it is is a treatment program that looks like a summer camp with a little summer school thrown in. So these are all the components of treatment that we use, all the evidence-based components of interventions for ADHD wrapped into a summer <coughs> camp context. So it looks like a summer camp. If you were to see it, uh, we actually run it in a Miami-Dade public school. If you were to drive by, you would know it was a treatment program for ADHD kids. You'd think it was summer school for the kids in the, uh, in the camp. There's a point system that's implemented, and there are counselors that are working with the kids all day long. The kids go through a variety of sports activities. And in the sports activities, they spend a few minutes at the beginning talking about what they're going to do, what the social skill of the day is, how they're going to exhibit good social skills in the context of the game they're about to play. Then they play a game, they get feedback throughout it, and then they debrief at the end of the hour and learn and talk about what they did that was good, why it was fun, what made it not fun, how they could do it differently next time. And then they cycle back the next hour doing a different sport, and they do that all day long. and they are in the classroom part of the day where we're using the classroom-based interventions that I talked earlier about ADHD kids taught by a teacher. And it's like a summer camp, so the kids also have fun. And, uh, and then finally, um, I think I was, these are the beneficial effects of behavioral interventions, and Dr. Fabiano already went over those, and we've already showed you that they're on all the evidence-based lists. Behavioral interventions are on the evidence-based lists. You can improve functioning at home, in school settings, in peer settings. Uh, the studies exist showing that it's effective for age 4 to 15. There are more studies with elementary kids than there are with adolescents. Moderate to large effect sizes. Uh, it's true no matter what the comorbidities are. So ADHD kids can also have conduct problems. They can also be anxious. They can also have oppositional defiant disorder. 
These interventions, behavioral interventions, work regardless of comorbidity. A lot of kids are a whole lot better, but for many kids, there's still room for improvement. So that's where we get to talking about adjunctive medication, which we'll go over later. So sometimes you can bring a child a long way with these comprehensive behavioral interventions. Sometimes you need more intervention. There's much less evidence as there is in the field of, uh, of the entire field of psychology for long-term benefits. We need more studies there. And uh, because there's little evidence on that, we need to be thinking about these, in uh, these initial interventions and how we can maintain those effects in the long run. And now we switch to medication. I'll try my best to be efficient. And I, I, you know, and I, I said this yesterday for all those unfortunate enough to suffer through me twice, that I, you know, I realize you know, we're all mental health clinicians here, um, but most of us aren't prescribers. But I think the goal here, and I think what's beneficial for any mental health clinician, is to be aware of what the role of the medication treatments are, have some basic understanding of what we know about how they work, what we know about what they do, very importantly, what we know about what they don't do, and predictable side effects. Because you have much more experience as clinicians than your average pediatrician does working directly with kids with ADHD. And most medications in this country are not written by child psychiatrists, people like me. They're written by primary care doctors, pediatricians, family practice doctors, who are familiar with the basics of the medicine but do not sit for extended periods of time with children with ADHD or certainly work with them in school-based settings. I have a few disclosures, uh, which I can probably memorize. I've done, just like Dr. Pelham, I've done work with drug companies, mostly do research studies for these medications. It is important to remember that when I go through these medicines. But as you'll see, I don't prioritize one medicine being the best fit for any child. And the goal here is not to turn it off. rank the medicines, because that you yeah, can't you do can that. That's different for any on. individual yeah. child. At the end of the day, they aren't that much different. So Dr. Pelham talked a little bit about the history of ADHD. And it dates back probably even farther than that. If you look at uh, German nursery rhymes around the turn of the end of the 20th century, there's very vivid descriptions of boys with ADHD, who unfortunately all end up dying in very graphic ways, because it's grim fairy tales, everybody dies. Uh, and then if you look back to when ADHD was first treated, uh, Dr. Bradley, in 1937, at a hospital in Rhode Island, started giving amphetamine to kids post-spinal tap uh, to help with their headache. And he know, I don't know if it helped their headache or not. I kind of doubt it. So what he noticed was the kids were much less hyperactive. So that was actually the first prescribed therapeutic use of stimulant medicine to treat ADHD. And that dates back to 1937. So now we have, what, 80, 90 years of trials with these medications. Uh, so these are very commonly used medications. Um, about 7%, about 5% of school-aged children are medicated for ADHD. Hopefully, most of them actually have ADHD, but 5% of kids are taking medicine for ADHD. Back in 2008, uh, almost 40 million prescriptions for ADHD were written, although that's children, adolescents, and adults. Uh, stimulants are now the most prescribed uh, medication for school-aged children. Uh, actually, they're number one for adolescents. They beat antibiotics for adolescents. For school-aged, elementary school kids, I think antibiotics still uh, are ahead of stimulant or ADHD medicines, but that's quite surprising. Because uh, everybody gets infections, not everybody has ADHD. Uh, what we've seen over the last few years is that use in school age kids has kind of leveled off around that 5%. But the boom market, so to speak, has been preschoolers, adolescents in particular, and then adults as well. So what we typically think of ADHD, those kids are still, a number of them are medicated, but now we're expanding into age ranges where we typically haven't thought of as a traditional ADHD patient, either because they're younger or older than average. Uh, and what we're also seeing is that these medicines are now being used in combination with a whole host of mental health medicines, anti antidepressants, uh, medicines for anxiety, antipsychotic medicines even to use typically to treat aggression. Um, but a variety of other medicines from other types of classes are being used to treat aggression and irritability in kids with ADHD. And unfortunately, that is something we don't have a lot of data on. Just like EEG and neurofeedback, this is stuff that's being done in the community that's starting to outpace uh, what we know about. And you can just see this graphically. Again, old school pointer. Uh, five School-age kids, use has been level from 2002 to 2010. Uh, it's, that actually is a significant increase, even though the numbers are very small. And then again, you see big use in adolescents and adults. So that's who's increasing. Next slide. 
So that's the history that I talked about. These are the different names that Dr. Pelham mentioned earlier. But again, as soon as the concept of minimal brain damage came about, shortly thereafter, we were starting to use medicine. That should have been. What if you hit the, does it show up? Hmm? Get to the next slide. Well, anyways, it's supposed to be on there. In 1937, Dr. Bradley started using medicine. Symptoms, we're not going to focus on much. We've talked about that already and the limits of that. Uh, so this is Calvin and Hobbes. Calvin is an eight-year-old, probably third-grade boy who's a very prototypical example of ADHD. Sorry if I'm blocking people. Uh, so it's just easier to see what is ADHD. And as you can see, teachers talking. Calvin looks like he's attentive, but he's in a galaxy far, far away. So we're in third grade. That's half of what we're talking about most of the time. All right, so this will take a second. So whenever I get up and talk about ADHD, I always try to justify that there is a, we have some understanding of the biological basis of it. It isn't something simply that's made up to create business for us. Um, and what we've seen now is we've taken uh, children and we've MRI'd their brains. We can see the size of their brain. And we compare kids with ADHD. And we compare kids without ADHD. And in fact, we can see a couple of things. This is the size of the brain. Uh, bigger is better, typically, up to a certain age. Uh, and what you can see is the ADHD brain actually is a little slower to develop, slower to reach its full thickness, because these are years. So this is age 5, 10, 15, 20. The ADHD brain, in its essence, is immature. It's slower to get to go where it's going, particularly in the areas involved in attention span. The part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex up here is involved in complex decision making and, and control of attention. And as you can see, the gap between the two lines is even bigger. The ADHD kids are a good three, four years behind where they should be. Now they get there. It doesn't mean you outgrow their ADHD, unfortunately, from everything we can tell for most kids. But there is a physical difference in brain size, on average, seen with ADHD. And then what happens in adolescence, just as the ADHD kids get all catch up, what happens in adolescence is the brain naturally gets smaller. It gets pruned to become more efficient. And that's what an adolescent start to develop better capacity to do more complex tasks like abstract reasoning. And again, the ADHD kids, now they kind of overshoot. The brain's too big. And then they're falling behind because the, the brain isn't efficiently pruning itself like it is. So they're behind on both levels much past this age. So we can see differences. Neurochemically, if we get down to the level of an individual nerve, uh, we have some understanding of what drives human behavior. For example, when you get rewarded, your, your nerves in your brain release a chemical called dopamine. It, what's it tends to reinforce behavior. We can go all the way back to Pavlov's dogs or all the way up now to uh, any type of reward. And dopamine is the main neurochemical driving that. And the more rewarding something is, the more dopamine is released. And over time, if you do the same thing every day and every day you find something to be rewarding, your brain starts to release dopamine in advance. Your brain becomes primed to experience something that you'll find pleasant or rewarding. And that's probably why many of the behavioral interventions we do can be quite helpful. They have a neurochemical basis to make the brain ready to pay attention and to receive something that it may like. Um, the problem in ADHD is that we think that this, doesn't, this system doesn't work very well. The ADHD brain is not set up well to neurochemically learn from past experiences. So this natural rise in dopamine that should make something more rewarding just doesn't happen. So it, it creates much more difficulty in doing behavioral interventions. And it tends to decrease the own natural motivation to do things like to get good grades just because you want to do well and stuff like that. So the bottom line with ADHD is that you need, the kids need to be, they need a greater level of outside motivation because of these underlying uh, neurochemical deficits. It's not because they're lazy. They're actually hardwired to be more dependent on the external world than their own internal biological systems to drive good behavior and success. No? Okay. So uh, dopamine goes all the way through different parts of the brain, including every part of the brain thought to be involved in attention, thinking, organization. There's certainly many more chemicals involved than just dopamine. Nothing in the brain is ever that simple because all parts of the brain tie into each other. Uh, but what we think goes on in ADHD is that the ADHD brain, again, is under-aroused. It doesn't have as much resting dopamine as it should. But the problem then also comes in when something interesting happens, like it's not break time yet. But if I say it's break, then everybody 
you get a big increase in dopamine because there's food out there. We all know that because there was food there yesterday at least. <laughs> the ADHD brain, that doesn't, what happens is that spike is excessive. Little distractors, little things like someone moving around behind you cause more of a release of dopamine than it should. So anything in the room is very interesting and distracting. But the stuff that should be rewarding, like the sense that there's food out there or the sense that you might get a good grade is under rewarding because of the deficits in uh, dopamine. So you're low to begin with, but when you're very prone to get distracted neurochemically by anything going on around you. So you take hits at both ends. And we think one of the, there's various parts of the brain that are involved in clearing dopamine from one nerve to another. And this is some of the effects of what the stimulant medicines do, very much like antidepressants we talked about yesterday. There, I can never get this title fixed, so I apologize for the weird spacing. But this is a study from the late 90s in adults. This is adults with ADHD and adults without ADHD who are otherwise medically and physically healthy. And they're in an MRI scanner, and the, the light parts here measure blood flow. Generally, more blood flow means more activity. More activity means greater capacity to do something well. And what these adults are doing is they're doing the color stroop, which is, if you've ever done it, it's this terribly annoying task where you're reading words that are colors. So you're reading the word red, blue, green, yellow, but they're printed in opposite colors than what they say. So red's in blue, blue's in red. You're supposed to hit a button every time you see the word red, but the word red is gonna be in blue ink. And our eyes can process color much faster than they can read text. So it's a measure of impulse control and also a measure of sustained attention. Uh, and traditionally, people with ADHD do not do very well on this. Uh, so what you can see, when they're doing the task, Adults use this little part of the brain primarily. There's a lot of activity going on here, and that's called the anterior cingulate. It's deep within the brain. It's a part involved in error checking as well as sustained attention. It's very rich in dopamine, at least it's supposed to be. In adults with ADHD, there ain't nothing going on there. There's no light. There's very little dopamine in the anterior cingulate in the ADHD brain, and so it doesn't light up. They're using large swaths of different parts of the brain, the temporal lobe, which are very uh, low in dopamine. So basically, the, the part that's supposed to be going on isn't kicking in, so you're using large backup generators that are really meant to be doing other things and are not very efficient at the natural activity you're supposed to be doing. I didn't put the slide in here, but now we have studies in adults and children showing if I give you medicine, stimulants like Ritalin, you go from, you go from this to almost but not quite as good as this. So the medicines are helpful in, in turning on whatever little dopamine is in the anterior cingulate and getting it to turn on when you're supposed to use these tasks. So there, we can see things within the brain to support the diagnosis, and our treatments make some sense from an imaging level. It doesn't mean that we know everything we should, but it does mean that we have a reasonable understanding of some of the biological deficits seen in the disorder. Okay, I just wanted to ask you, but when you just said, uh it shows some of the biological basis of the disorder, but just to make sure people understand this, you're not suggesting that people run out and get an MRI because that can then be used to diagnose a single no, kid. No, the trick, the trick with MRIs, A, they're very expensive. Insurance doesn't cover it, so there's a practicality level. I, um, B, there's huge individual variability in the brain size and activity, especially from one child to another, because the child's brain is something in motion. It's growing, it's developing, just like bones. So there's huge variability from one kid to another. So we can't give you a static picture of a healthy brain and an ADHD brain that are clearly so different that you can always box one kid in into it and to another. When we do studies like these, these are dozens to hundreds of kids or adults averaged together. And then a statistical program creates these images. And it shows that we can clearly see a pattern. But the average person may be somewhere in between these two that has ADHD or not. So you can't go to a commercial MRI and, and then have an image of your brain taken and be told whether you have ADHD or be told whether or not your medicine is going to work. We may get there someday. Unfortunately, some people advertise that they're there now. That, unfortunately, is not true and very expensive. 